Let's start with the introduction. So as the effects of climate change have an increasing impact, one of the most severe is the erratic and unpredictable effect on rainfall. And it's quickly becoming clear that even non-brittle landscapes are becoming susceptible to both drought and inundation as precipitation patterns become less frequent and more severe. In this expert panel today, we'll discuss the ways that farmers can help to restore the healthy hydrological cycle through land management practices, through revegetation, protection of riparian zones, improvement of soils, and a whole lot more. So joining us on this panel are three of the most influential voices in landscape hydrology restoration from around the world. Starting first with Nicole Masters, who is an independent agroecologist, systems thinker, storyteller, educator, and author of the book, For the Love of Soil. With over 20 years of practical and theoretical experience in regenerative agriculture, she is also recognized as a knowledgeable and dynamic speaker on the topic of soil health. Next up is Zach, <laughs> Zach Weiss. He is the protege of revolutionary Austrian farmer Sepp Holzer. And Zach is the first person to earn Holzer practitioner certification directly from Sepp. Zach went on to create elemental ecosystems to provide an action-oriented process to improve clients' relationships with their landscape. Elemental Ecosystems is an ecological development, contracting, and consulting firm specializing in watershed restoration and ecosystem regeneration. And last but not least, Mark Shepard is the CEO of Forest Agriculture Enterprises, LLC, and founder of Restoration Agriculture Development, LLC, and an award-winning author of the books Restoration Agriculture and Water for Any Farm. He is most widely known as the founder of New Forest Farm, the 106 acre perennial agricultural savanna. And of course, these are only just very short introductions. Both or all of our panelists are very accomplished in their own right, but we'll be getting through some of the details of their work through examples in these questions. But to start us off, I would love to open up the discussion by asking what the potential of a landscape with a restored water cycle can do. And it seems to me like there are some great examples that are very relevant right now with the extreme climactic events that are happening in the US at the moment. Maybe starting with Mark, because you're really living this at the moment, as are the other two. Tell us about how your landscape has dealt with the challenges that you're currently experiencing much differently than some of the surrounding farms. <laughs> Well, some of the uh, some of the advantages, uh, of course, are the fact that whenever it rains, you know, all the ponds fill up. Uh, I have uh, there's over 40 little what I call pocket ponds on this property. Um, there's amphibians right now that are all chirping outside, whereas around me it's almost cooked, you know, cooked to a desert. It's so so dry. So I get amphibians for for insect control and that sort of thing. Uh, all of that water spreads out, discharges at specific discharge zones. On, on this property, I designed them out to be on the ridges, which are stonier, dry, bonier uh, pieces of property. So the ridges, are, even the ridges are green right now, whereas other hay fields are starting to cook on the, uh, on the ridges. Um, some of the, it's not a downside, it appears to be a downside if you're growing row crops, is on wet years. So two years ago and three years ago, we had twice the normal rainfall. Um, instead of you know, 30, 36 inches of rain, we got like 75 inches of rain in a year. So my annual crop fields, I basically didn't grow any annual crops that year. It was strictly all perennials because um, <clears throat> it was just too wet to get into the fields. Uh, I'll, take, I'll take too much rain instead of not enough rain. So the, the hydration of the landscape is key to absolutely everything. Without, without the water, your soil life doesn't wake up. It doesn't release the nutrients for your crops, your plants, et cetera. You know, your livestock, you have to pump water. Our water is 300 feet deep if I want to run that pump. It's like I dim the lights of the nearest village. It's, it's such a large pump to bring it up. Um, I'll hand it off to whoever's next. That's, that's part of what it is here. Is the only, there's only been three times in my life on this farm here in the past 25 years that I actually cut and sold hay. And I cut and sold hay during a drought year because I had green grass and I cut and sold hay. So in a drought year, thinking about it, if, if you have green grass, you cut it as hay, it doesn't get rained on, it's a drought year. What's the price of hay like when nobody else has hay? So I got to capitalize on the fact that it had a, a high hay price with the highest quality, you know, never rained on hay during the, during the drought years. So we're, we're, you know, moderated, the extremes get moderated here because we have 
excellent soil health because we have the water to wake up the soil life, deep rooted perennials, uh, et cetera. Wonderful. And Nicole, tell us about some of the conditions where you are, as well as some of what you've seen of the potential for restoring hydrological function on land to places that you visited and traveled to. Mm. It's really interesting because we, um, I don't know how many thousand miles we did, like maybe two and a half thousand miles in the last two weeks, uh, driving through Montana, Wyoming, Colorado, South Dakota, and really, you know, seeing that picture of landscapes in total water dysfunction. Um, and unfortunately, I can't say I saw any examples that were like shining lights of having hydrology that's really working, except for some of the properties um, that I'm working with here in Montana. And, you know, it's really the difference between profitability and success and people staying on the land and people leaving. And it is, you know, our ability to adapt to this is going to be the difference between um, life and death, really. Um, and so... We've seen some extraordinary examples of um, water cycles that do work. And, you know, what we're currently dealing with is, oh, you guys call um, landscapes like watersheds. We, we call them water catchments. I think maybe if we changed it to a water catchment instead of a shed, maybe we'd start behaving a little differently. But it seems like these are landscapes that are shedding, like they're actively like, no, I don't want any water. I'm just trying to repel these um, every single drop. And so the game that I play with some of my ranches is like, when someone says, how much rainfall did you get? You want to be able to say all of it. And this is what we're seeing in landscapes now is how do we restore that sponge, which is going to lengthen your growing season. It's going to reduce plant stress. It's going to increase nutrition. We're seeing big outbreaks and things like grasshoppers right now. That's all about plant stress. Um, yeah, so, I mean, this is, this is the game. How do we build our soil health? Nice. And Zach, why don't you tell us about some of the challenges that you're experiencing out there in Oregon? Yeah, I mean, out here, it's severe drought conditions. The fire conditions are going to be unlike, you know, last year is going to be a warm up if things don't change. Um, and it really takes me back to 2019 in Australia and seeing that horrific fire season. I was there right in the middle of it. And then seeing these wonderful properties that just show the potential of restoring the hydrology. You had one Martin Royds where the river was running dry, the town was running out of water, but his leaky weirs were still discharging water. And so he was actually able to offer up his water to the community because he was the only one that had it. You see people like Peter Marshall, who with his forestry management and hydrology management, he had the fire circle him for two months coming from every different angle and he was able to take crown fires to ground fires and then you go to India and look at people like Rajendra and you just see you know 250,000 wells restored seven rivers flowing perennial and reducing the temperature in the whole region two degrees celsius wow that is so cool <laughs> that is really remarkable and it it goes to show that i mean you don't necessarily have to do this on a entire giant landscape to start to see the benefits. Uh, although obviously the larger that you scale it up, the more that this can transform an entire, let's say water catchment instead of watershed. So from there, let's move to ask, what are some of the first steps in determining the necessary interventions to repair the hydrology on a landscape? And I've talked to you about this, Zach, in the past. So why don't we start with you? Because you've really developed a skill set of going to a a client's place or a piece of land and reading the landscape for those indicators that give you an insight into what interventions would be the first steps. Yeah, absolutely. I think it really starts with the nature of the landscape itself, doing a really honest assessment of it, understanding what its natural tendencies are. From that, you can already start to see a little bit of a timeline of how that landscape has changed by reading different ways and patterns that water is moving through the landscape. You can actually sometimes see some very clear things that were done previously, like dredging of waterways straighter, drainage systems, drain tile, all of these watershed things that are really leading to these issues. Um, and so then looking at it's always important to consider the goals of the people because if you don't, you can make this beautiful paradise that just gets bulldozed because people didn't value it or understand it. And then trying to figure out, you know, I'm oftentimes working or looking in the margins. So, so many farms around America and around the world have all of these 
margin lands that are too wet to really farm. They're too steep and gullies. And so they end up being the only forest left on the farm. But they're also oftentimes the points where you can do a little bit of work to restore hydrology in a big portion of the earth. Um, so it's really a matter of looking at the shape of the land, the geological consistency of the land, and then an idea of how water moves through the landscape, the yearly precipitation cycles, how much catchment areas you have. And then you can put those together to see where basically the acupuncture points are for the hydrology within the land. Excellent. And Nicole, in your experience, what are some of the first things that you look for when assessing uh, the, the most impactful things that you can do to restore the hydrological function of a piece of land? Um, if I can ask Dorian to turn off his microphone, that'd be cool. Thank you. There we go. <laughs> um, well, one, yeah, some of the first things, I guess, around hydrology is to take like Zach says, take a step back. And what I'm looking for are what are the drivers that have created this current system? Why is that water system not functioning like it should? Um, we might be looking for things like, you know, is there actual water repellency? Are there waxy coatings in these soils? What's happening with aggregate stability? Um, how well is the system actually infiltrating? Um, and then I have a process that I call the five M's to look for what is it that's the underlying leverage point behind this you know is it your mindset like are you part of the problem and generally that it, that is what we find is the biggest issue with water cycles is the human um uh, is it your management which quite often it is is it low organic matter is it a microbial imbalance or a mineral imbalance and we kind of go to work from that perspective in terms of all right why is it that we now have environments that are actually literally shedding water um, is it due to a lack of diversity um, what can we do to kind of um, yeah really speed up that transition so when I'm working with someone and they first started down this journey um, I look to air before I look to water, because if your air, that air movement, porosity, all of that isn't working, then your water cycle is going to be stuffed. So we kind of have a process. And actually, there's a process even before that, which is sunlight capture. How well are we capturing sunlight in this environment? Because, you know, that sunlight is going to be drawing sugars down into the soil. And if you've ever noticed this, if you have like a, a cup of sugar, white, white sugar sitting on a bench, you'll see how quickly it gets a crust on the outside of that surface. That sugar that's that's being drawn down from the plant into soil actually draws water to it too, out of very very dry conditions. So, um, you know, I, I'm working a lot in semi-arid environments, and and um, this is the game that we're out to achieve. Wow, those are some cool insights that I hadn't considered. Actually, looking at the air in the landscape was not an answer that I was would have predicted. How about you, Mark? Uh, with all the consultancies that you're doing and certainly the range of places that you've seen, including your own farm, what have been some of the interventions that you look to do for the highest impact? Well, um, I wanted to ditto everything that Zach said, everything that Nicole said. Uh, and then uh, one of the things that Zach mentioned uh, is what I, I'm kind of notorious for is I'm looking for the ditches on the side of the road, the edges of this and that and the other thing what is actually surviving in this region all by itself with sheer total utter neglect. And then that tells me that if I want to have a system that can subsist there for a long period of time uh, with no care whatsoever, I should plant species very closely related to that in systems that are very similar to it. The shape of the land has a lot to do with it as well. Where does the water, um, where is the water captured? Uh, where does the water flow? Where does it end up uh, either infiltrating or running away? A classic example in uh, the USA anyways, and, and I know both Zach and Nicole have seen these, the USDA will come into a landscape. Some farmer has a wet spot down at the bottom of the, of the, of the catchment. I like the idea of changing our language so it's not a watershed anymore. And the <laughs> USDA will put a pond down there because that's where all the water goes to well, if it's down at the bottom of the landscape, now it has to be very deeply and um, after all that, all that water that is up, um, as the most expensive, for example, the most fragile, the most likely to blow out because of the quantity of water that's hitting it. 
And the only reason why that spot is a wet spot is because the water didn't soak in up there where it actually fell on the ground and it was allowed to run. So by using the shape of the land, capturing the water up high, uh, spreading the water out, soaking it in, discharging it where, where we decide to discharge it, setting it up in a pattern that makes it easy to, uh, to use equipment with, <clears throat> all of those things are, are a part of the system. But the, the most significant probably with, with uh, what, what our team does is looking to as closely mimic the uh, natural ecosystem um, as closely as possible and substituting a can harvested for human food, animal feed, uh, and then use animals as the managers of the system. So we're doing um, ecosystem restoration with agriculturally productive species. We're not necessarily, um, matter of fact, we don't, we don't plant orchards uh, and we're not doing purist ecological restorations where you use herbicide to get rid of every you know, invasive. We're making agriculturally productive landscapes that are modeled after natural ecosystems. Amazing. Um, and since you've worked in all types of places, different climates, different parts of the world, have you started to notice any patterns of what the common degradation factors of? I mean, basically, so many times the problems are better solved by removing the damaging element or, or the practice that is causing the damage rather than adding some sort of Band-Aid feature. So what I guess what I'm trying to say is what are some of the most damaging practices of a landscape or, or their features that should be removed before other interventions can actually be effective? You start, start, well, I guess I'll start with yeah, yeah, go for it. open. Uh, for, for what I've seen around the world and you do the historical research, it has everything to do with annual crops agriculture. Now, I'm not saying that we get rid of annual crops agriculture altogether but I'm saying we have to learn how to do it radically different. We have to improve the soils. We have to capture what rainfall comes in, soak it in uh, and minimize the annual agriculture that we do um, simply because every time we're tilling the soil, we're oxidizing organic matter, um, off gassing into the atmosphere, the, the ammonia, the nitrous oxides that are going in the atmosphere and on and on and on. And just the wind erosion, oh my gosh, last time I was in Oregon, um, they were harvesting wheat simultaneous with uh, all these forest fires all around. And you couldn't see, you literally almost could not breathe. And it was at the same time that they were preparing the, um, the soil underneath hazelnut groves, which are orchards. They planted on level flat ground and they remove every speck of vegetation from the soil uh, aggressively every single year. And it's all this, all of our topsoils just going off into the atmosphere. And then any natural ecosystem that was around because it was too crisp um, and too brittle, burnt, you know, burnt up all around us. This kind of a, our, our entire method of doing agriculture has been a disaster for the past 10,000 years. Yeah, it's intense. Uh, Zach, what about yourself? What are some of the damaging elements and practices on landscapes that you've seen that need to be addressed before solutions can be implemented? Yeah, I would say really ditto to everything Mark just said. Um, and for me, I would break it down into the humanity has really changed how water is moving through the air and how water is moving through the ground. We've changed how water is moving through the air by getting rid of all the forests that dominated the planet, that seeded the clouds, both with the moisture itself that's required for 50% of the precipitation we receive, but also with the hygroscopic microorganisms, which coalesce humid hazes into clouds and then rain, um, which is then also changing weather patterns, which is changing how much of the water from the ocean is moving through the Earth's continents. So we're really destroying the air water cycle, our vegetative man or our vegetative destruction, you could say, which I think agriculture is the biggest thing there. Um, agriculture and forestry, even our forestry practices are atrocious all around the world. But then we're also changing how water is moving through the ground with all of these drainage systems, with all the city infrastructure, with all of the roads that exist, all our water shedding structures with attached drainage to carry the water even further away. Um, and I think it's important to recognize that there was a time when this served us, when the earth was a really lush, beautiful place with water landscapes all over the place, and we were defecating in the streets, we didn't want standing water around our civilizations because of disease vectors and all these other issues. We're doing the same water management, even though 
that doesn't suit us anymore. And now it's actually causing all of these issues of flood, of drought, and of fire. Um, so, you know, the drainage of the water in the ground, a lot of which was actually to create our agricultural areas, we drained the wetlands to release the best soils. Um, and then the drainage of the water cycle through the air through manipulating the vegetation and changing how water moves through the continents. Mm. And Nicole, what about from your experience? Not quite ready to poop in the streets again, Zach, though, if that's an option. Um, <laughs> I'm ready. I'm, I'm ready um, to make that change. <laughs> um, what, I mean, so many of our practices really put microbiology on a starvation diet and, you know, anything involving bare soil. So if that's cultivation or spraying out or overgrazing, des desertification, all of whatever's creating those kind of practices needs to shift and, um, I really point to Mark's, what he was drawing forward in terms of monocultures, but just thinking in terms of diversity, like everything needs to be considered in terms of how do we increase diversity here? How do we increase that mosaic factor um, in landscapes? Because most landscapes, like if you go to, you know, early colonial kind of accounts, they were mosaics. It wasn't like we just have solid forest, you know, which might have been because there, there's fires, there's ruminants, there's all sorts of things moving through landscapes. So how do we kind of look to to recreate that? And for me, it's the micro that's influencing the macro. Um, and it's that how do we get just that sponge reestablished? So what are the things that are undermining it? And if you think every single microbe in the soil is made up of at least 70% water. You know, they're a huge component of just how water is moving through the soil is with microbiology or even how fungi will bring uh, water from much further down in the soil profile up to plants, but it won't do that if you've undermined it by having bare soil or cultivating or pretty much everything in our toolkit of modern agriculture is what's led us to this point. And I think that's what we're seeing globally is this wake up of, this is probably one of the shortest exoduses into a type of agriculture. I mean, we're really only maybe 120 years, 140 years. And it's like, that didn't work. I mean, many of what we saw in China or Mayan civilizations, they were thousands of years with their agricultural innovations. And this one really has been a very short, sharp jerk on the reins. And, and part of how we get the diversity and part of how we we get the, all the different soil life and different depths of rooting, et cetera. And it's a tool that we rely on heavily, break up the field sizes, et cetera, is the agroforestry techniques. I see the agroforestry techniques as kind of like this bridge between the, the agriculture of eradication and then the agriculture of restoration. And then when mm -hmm. we get to uh, a silvopasture system, which is an agroforestry system with all these woody plants and animals in it, to me, that seems like the, uh, that's, that's the home run, that's the whole. Do you think, Mark, like a lot of the landscapes, like if you think of coming through Colorado, Wyoming, South Dakota, they wouldn't, they didn't never really had a lot of trees. So uh, do you think, yeah, tell that, me about that. Well, well that, that, uh, that goes to a, uh, a regionally appropriate, specifically applied set of techniques. It would be yeah. fewer trees in the more arid areas, more trees in the moister, more humid areas. Uh, you know, there's there's trees in Greenland and uh, up at, almost at the North Pole. They may be only willows about this tall, but they're every single continent has has woody plants on them. Period. And so mm -hmm. to imitate that distribution pattern with our agricultural crops, and if we can go to our agricultural crops being the perennials all of a sudden we have a perennial ecosystem that's producing food, fuels, medicines, and fibers. Yeah. So yeah, maybe in, okay. in Arizona, for example, the trees would be further apart. They'd obviously be different species. And I think it was in, in Arizona that they, they dug up a mesquite and they kept chasing the roots down. And at 412 feet deep, they decided it was too dangerous to keep digging. And the, root was still, the roots were still the thickness of a pencil. So all of this talk about like perennial grasslands are so wonderful. They hold the soil together. Dang, you can't beat a tree. <laughs> yeah. But certainly that uh, location specific context and doing a proper inventory, not only of what grows well there, but also what grew there historically. And like you do for 
agricultural landscapes, finding related plants that have some sort of economic value that can take the place of less productive species, right? And you have to also project future and do some uh, assisted migration. And you know, the New Forest Farm here, the southwest corner of it has species that are more adapted to Colorado, for example, than they are in Wisconsin, because I want something that can handle cold and dry because it, it gets both here. Uh, and then the northeastern corner of this property, we have a lot more of the way further north plants. So we have the genetic resources on site we're constantly breeding and selecting for the varieties that actually thrive in this system here. And if we have to go, you know, more colder, hotter, wetter, drier, we've got the species on board um, and we're ready to put them in the ground. Time for, time for big, beautiful experiments uh, with, you know, PhDs and stuff like that. We still need it, but dang, to wait for more research, the time is over. We know, we know how, what to do. We have all of the tools at our disposal. We just got to get stuff done. I almost said the S word stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I think too, to build off of what both of you guys are saying, it's the trees and the fungi are responsible for bringing so much moisture up from down deep. And I've seen a lot of landscapes that used to have trees in the past where you go four feet down and there's actually water in the whole landscape, but none of the plant roots can reach it because the trees used to be the ones that had the deep roots to bring it up. So, you know, in areas like Yakima, where you look and it's like, oh man, this is a desert, trees could never survive here. There actually were, it was a dotted landscape with trees on all of the braids of the earth, all the creeks and the streams and the rivers. They were actually actively helping move that water up into the higher horizons as well so that the grasses and other species could utilize it. Yeah, and then if you think about the impact that we're seeing in Western Australia from the removal of trees, because that's an open savanna land that had a lot of, you know, big old mama and papa trees, is that that's totally changing that water dynamic in the soil now. So we're seeing, I think, the salinity of 50 million acres in Western Australia because that whole water cycle is disrupted because the trees potentially, you know, they're, they're using that water in that top zone without the trees that's just being sucked up by the sun and drying conditions and evaporation. And uh, here comes the, the salts. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that's that whole landscape context. I, have you guys seen that new research about how trees are growing faster because of the carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere? I know I threw this to you last time, Zach, about it seemed to me like I'm going to so many places where um, standing forests are dying. And if that's in Australia or New Zealand or here, um, are you guys seeing something similar like that happening? And I'm wondering, like, is it turning to a grassland ecosystem that can be adapted to low rainfall? Just to throw it. I see a lot of dying forests. Most of the ones that I see, I really look at as nature is actually trying to help because it's not a forest, it's a tree farm. Um, yeah. So most of the most of the dying forests that I see, I would really say are more tree farms and are whether being managed actively or not, they're having the structural issues of a lack of diversity. And so all of the different species of nature are saying, hey, I can help this. I'll kill a bunch of these dug firs and then we can start to have a more diverse <laughs> forest but we don't look at it as them helping us. No, see, that's not happening in New Zealand. These are diverse native forests that are, that are dying. And, and as, as yeah. far as the, like, the uh, full closed canopy forest is concerned, every single part of the USA, except for some places down in, um, in uh, Florida, uh, in most of uh, Central America was all savanna, semi-open grassed forested areas going all the way back to the dawn of woody species. Um, so, so that has to be said, it's trees and grass have co-evolved in most of the places around here. And then uh, the die-offs that we're seeing here, if you think in the last hundred years, we had white pine blister rust that I, has always been here because there've always been currents and pines coexisting with each other, but it only blew up after we eradicated the massive pineries. Then there was um, uh, Dutch elm disease, there was chestnut blight, uh, gypsy moth, and now we've got the emerald ash borer like Michigan's lost, you know, half, almost half of the, the trees in its forest because of, of these non-native uh, non pests and diseases. Now in the long mm -hmm. scope of history of time, that's not a problem. You know, nature will heal mm -hmm. from that, but short term, 
if part of your economic livelihood is depending on these forests as a resource, and there's certain Native American tribes in uh, the Great Lakes region, they identify themselves by the ash tree because that's their, all their baskets, their, their building materials, et cetera, et cetera. So what do you do when the basis of your culture disappears because some bug from somewhere else? And I was looking at the comments over here, one of the uh, folks had mentioned the megafauna, uh, the, whether you were in the Great Plains where you had uh, mammoths, you know, the, the Pacific coast where you had like three different kinds of mammoth, couple different kinds of um, mastodons. Here in the, the humid east, it was mostly, uh, mostly mastodon. There were always elephants around here knocking the trees over and eating the tops off of it. Most of the savanna species are, are adapted, uh, created, adapted, evolved, or however you, they got here to be pushed over and then sprout back up from the roots. Whether it's a storm that pushes it over or, a, or an elephant that pushes it over, there's a depression, there's a mound, and there's organic matter mixed with mineral soil. That is the number one um, micro topography form all across the planet are pits and mounds. So when we're designing systems and I'm looking right behind Zach and I see some pits and mounds right behind him and Sepp was a, you know, he's a notorious, you know, terrace mound builder, whatever. Um, other people accuse me of being a swila, if I can be so Australian. Swila. Yeah. That sounds very swila. Australian. <laughs> so you put your, <laughs> sorry about that. So you have your, your swales, uh, USDA terraces, whatever. You have a water conveyance channel and a mound to capture that water. So we're lining them up to direct that water where we want, specifically over to some of those ponds right behind Zach's heads. So are we, am I seeing forests accelerating in growth? Uh, I don't don't have the data on that um, that says that. Uh, and I'm seeing just a tremendous amount of forests in trouble. Now we have the uh, woolly adelgid on the uh, hemlocks in the east, all kinds of outbreaks of, of pests and diseases in forestry. And did you know that um, human beings have yet to eradicate one of them? We've, we've, we've lost, trying to fight against it, we've lost. So why don't we work with it, understanding that these new these new climate conditions, new rainfall patterns and new storm patterns and new insects and diseases, these are the new disturbance patterns that are arising. We now have to adapt ourselves to the current reality by having a relationship with our landscape and understanding how ecology itself actually works and then applying that to what we do uh, raising, raising crops and livestock. Well, so there have been a couple of questions and even some short mentions already about the risk of salinization of soils. Uh, would anybody like to talk about how that can start to be reversed after maybe addressing some of the risks of or the causes of how it starts in the first place? Nicole? Yeah, so uh, a lot of the areas that I'm working on that have you know, big salinization issues are often cropping. So we have more uh, opportunities, I guess, in large scale cropping. And these are really flat lands as well. But, um, and these guys are looking at um, alley, you know, introducing alley species um, into cropping to some degree. But what they're doing is they can either put down things like a humic acid or vermicast or compost extract. So it's the carbon or the humic fraction that that's the antidote in a lot of ways to, um, to sodium. So we're seeing some, some great um, shrinking of those saline seeps through the addition of carbon-based materials that's, that's been phenomenal. But I think too, um, yeah, getting trees back into the landscape and thinking, you know, uh, what I'm seeing actually, it's interesting is that a lot of rangeland is actually deficient in sodium. And the reason for that is very old landscapes have leached out and, um, Put that into these depressions so we see areas that have gone alkali and it's like well where did that sodium come from you know a lot of it came from landscape that's leached out so um i'm always looking for addressing that at the root cause and then um yeah we very effectively and classic whole it's uh, the soil biology you think of every single living cell, it's just a bag of salt water. You want to get rid of that salt, put it into, into bio. Amen to that, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> 
So one of the ideas or the suggestions that was in here was the idea of putting organic matter on top of the soil as a remedy for salinization. Is that something that you found works fairly well? I mean, it may be somewhat impractical on very large landscapes, but could that possibly kickstart the biology that can digest those salts? Um, not if you're not really addressing the underlying cause. And you think of a lot of these landscapes where the they are issues. If you just throw compost on top, it just desiccates and blows away anyway. Like the microbiology aren't necessarily going to um, get down into the soil. So finding ways to protect that if you were putting carbon down. So direct drilling, putting it down with seeds, um, coating seeds. Uh, we've had really good success with bale grazing. So the effect of, you know, just putting bales into the middle of some of these areas and allowing livestock to kind of incorporate and trample and massage that soil a bit to get organic material in there. But I think from a cost, you know, return on investment, like how long would you pay that off? You know, the bale grazing or even composts, um, you want to have really good compost. And most of the compost I see people applying is absolute garbage so just being really careful like if you're gonna put some of that stuff on is it is it beautiful you know microbially diverse and alive um and finding ways to ensure that it's not going to die when you put it out I'll, I'll address that also as well is that i'm totally into minimizing inputs and what i'm going to do is i'm going to use three people that aren't here as an example if we go to Gary Zimmer, he's talking about mineral balance, mineral balance, mineral balance, mineral balance. You can go ahead and get your cations perfectly balanced. And if you don't have enough water to light up the microbial life, it's not going to light up. And you might have the wrong microbial life there when it does get rain and it goes in a direction that you don't want. So then there's folks like Elaine Ingham. It's all about the bugs, the bugs, the bugs. It's the soil life, soil life. Just put this tea on. But if you put them there, they don't have anything to eat. They're going to die, just like, like um, Nicole just said. Well, then there's the Gabe Brownies. Well, it's all about the cover crop smorgasbord. You put a zillion different cover crops down, but if you don't have the soil life there, and if you don't have the right mineral balance there, and if you don't have the water there in the first place, my personal opinion is that the water precedes everything. If we don't have water, we can't grow plants. If we don't have plants, we can't feed animals. We have to manage that water, rehydrate the landscape, then we can adjust our mineral balance, our soil life, and our cropping um, mix. And then I'll add this fourth guy who happens to be here is, is me. If we're mimicking the natural plant community types of that region and that area, selecting the food producing species from it will have the best chance of success when we do all of those things. There's not one true answer here. It's, it's all about the big system, the big ecological system of this planet. Yeah, I think it's just classic human reductionism to want to just distill it down to, oh, well, we just need to do this one thing when nature has never and never will work that way. It is this diverse interconnected web and you can't just pull out one piece and study it in isolation and learn anything about the whole. Um, so yeah, I just echo that really anything to do with ecology the interconnectedness is the resilience of that ecosystem. And so you can't just pull out single elements. You really have to look at it as a whole. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is, I mean, which is why context is where it all comes down to. And I kind of run from the room screaming if anyone's got a single answer to anything. And it, it is really interesting because you see these beautiful examples that do re work really well in that context. And you've mentioned some of them, Mark, and then people try and take that exact program and transplant it and put it on their place at huge expense and often a whole lot of disasters. Um, so yeah, for me, it starts with like compaction is the first place before water for me. So it's like trying to figure out what, what is it with compaction? And I know you guys like your iron or machinery to kind of address some of that, but it's like, well, what's the underlying cause of that? Was that something I have done with my management? And if I, you know, open that soil up, then water is going to be added in there or is it something else that's going to contribute to that, to that water cycle? So, um, yeah, I always get really curious about that whole ecosystem function. And most of the compaction issues that, that I encounter are caused by previous farming practices. And that's mm -hmm. where, you know, yeah, you can do it purely biologically through time, but you can get it faster, you know, a lot faster results if you use steel, appropriately applied steel. 
Notice, appropriately applied. It's got to be context specific. Yeah, a great example, actually, is Dakota Cohen up in um, uh, Alberta. He went to a workshop of mine and immediately said, oh, I, I got to put ponds way up over here. So he went and he dug like a $30 million pond and it didn't fill because he was putting it out of context within the scope of his landscape. And it wasn't until later that he, it dawned on him that I wasn't giving a, uh, a prescription. I was getting a set of principles. We follow these set of principles and I, I loosely follow the whole yeoman scale of permanence on what I decided to do first. And I'll grant you the point on, um, you know, breaking compaction to get the water to go in because what good is actually water if it doesn't soak in, we can actually make things worse. If you have water ponding in a particular area, you can start it to, into a, a, a cycle of anaerobic collapse and you're going to go acidic and formaldehydes and then it'll be 20 years before you get crops to grow there again. So once again, it's a, it's a systematic systems approach. So if there's one true answer, Nicole, and please don't run out of the room, it's equal. <laughs> everything. The only thing that's going to make me run out of the room is you calling me an Australian again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, New Zealand. New Zealand. Very Australians different. were prisoners. That's right. You, you guys were free. That's right. We were free. Yeah, we didn't steal bread buns from anybody. <laughs> Well, so look, it sounds like we're talking a lot or continuing to refer to the scale of permanence. And I know that that is a framework that a lot of people continue to use. And then Mark has expanded upon on his book, uh, Water for Any Farm. Let's just address some of those because starting with that landform, really the first element that we can start to affect on a piece of land, busting up compaction, putting in key line earthworks or ponds or catchment systems. Is that really where you would always start? Or are there simpler interventions, especially for people with lower budgets or perhaps who don't have access to professionals who can perform some of those services for them that can make a difference without having to affect the landform itself? I think I'd love to jump in there. I think one big piece, and Nicole mentioned this as well, um, that you know, I think Darren Doherty brought to the key line scale of permanence is the climate of the mind, because I think that mindset and management, you got to look at those two things first, because you can move all the earth in the world. And if you don't have the mindset in line with the landscape, and you don't have a management in line with the landscape, it's not going to go well, and you're going to cause more harm than good. Um, so I would say even taking it back to just that you know, what am I doing on this landscape? What are my goals and what are my actions on the landscape? And what is are the responses that the landscape gives me as a result of those? Really a careful consideration of that because that's oftentimes, like you were saying earlier, just to stop doing the harm can do more benefit than all of the big actions that you might take after you stop doing the harm. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I really encourage people to do like basic infiltration tests and just look at, you know, what is happening with compaction or water movement through soils and then going back to, well, what is it that created that? Was that, you know, is it just the mismanagement or is it that low organic matter? Is it biology or minerals? And so we find if we address that underlying driver, then so, for instance, working on an operation that had 60% magnesium, I am not going to go and try and address that magnesium minerally, like it'll cost you a fortune, but these soils with high mag become super tight. So all that we did was actually drill gypsum, a little bit of gypsum down with the drill when we were seeding, and that just flocculated and opened it up around that root zone and then that plant was able to open that soil up and that's where you know you could use a cover crop in that instance with a little bit of gypsum just to flocculate and open it up um, but if it's a biological issue is it just very high bacterial soils and we see these with the waxy coatings or surface crusts that these soils are not functional what is it that I can maybe do to stimulate um, other types of microbiology so that that could be your compost or your bale grazing um, that again, it could be cover crops, they could fulfill on that. So we're always looking for what is it that's actually driving this because otherwise you're going to end up in a situation where that compaction happens again. And, you know, working in very different ecotypes and very different rainfall zones and very different mineral kind of considerations, I find that there's not a one, you know, a one silver bullet answer to, to this. I love being on panels with people who give all my answers. It's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Hmm. 
I would add into that one piece I really like people to consider as far as just a first step on the land is what impact are you having on the water cycle? We, we all have homes, we all have roads, we might have a lot of roads, we might have more drainage, you know, just before we talk about having a benefit impact on the water cycle, we need to gain neutrality. Um, mm. And oftentimes we're nowhere close to neutral. So looking at those impacts and looking at how you might directly offset them. You know, is it as simple as a rain, water, rain garden catching the gutters off of your building so that that water that used to infiltrate into the earth can infiltrate into the earth? Same for off of driveways or parking areas or anything like that. It's just a real easy win to look at what is my impact on this land and how can I offset it? I, I like, like your whole... Uh, topic where you're going at with that, that Zach and just a couple of things especially with people in residential areas uh, be aware of the fact that if you soak water into the soil it's going to go into your basement and if not your basement somebody else's so be careful do context specific approaches no matter where you are check things out um, thank you very important point there <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then one of the things that that you know as a as a you know, restoration ecologist is we're looking at a target uh, ecosystem or target plant community type. So by looking at the ditches and the edges on the side of the road, we find out where this place wants to go all by itself. We preload it ahead of time, or we do floristic relays where we start with this species, introduce the next one and the next one, the next one. And we have a target ecosystem of where it is actually going. And that's informed by what you learn on the ground what, you know, what is our neutral state as a human being? How do I interact with this land? Uh, and then um, design the whole land use pattern to enhance that, that process. Um, and one of the things that I think should happen, there's probably some people who are listening uh, that are into, that like live in suburban areas. If you're in the USA and you're in a suburban area, start attempting to pass laws that say that every single home single family home in the USA, it can heat itself, it can power itself, it can provide its own water from the ambient environment, period. It's a design consideration. And if our homes don't heat themselves, cool themselves, uh, power themselves and capture their own water, we have designed things wrong. And until we've done that, uh, you know, that's the work that has to happen. And if you're going to buy a home or, or build a new home, if you do it any other way besides heating itself, powering itself, cooling itself, providing its own water. You screwed up. Stop. I imagine you guys have read Michael Mobb's book, The Sustainable House, which I think was written in 1999. And he's transformed his community in Sydney through that very thing. Like, how do you capture, how do you totally close the loops externally or internally which is so phenomenal and I think it would revolutionize cities right now but I think there's almost an agenda to stop this they looked at this in Auckland city of what would be the cost to actually put in these huge pipelines um, from a river that was pretty far away to pump that into Auckland city and it would have been much cheaper to put a water catchment system on every single house and not be compromising that river but you know they went to the river they're not going to be like empowering people. You can't be off the grid now, Mark. <laughs> like, how can we control you now? <laughs> so many good but, points here. I would love to go in deep. This is my old specialty is designing natural homes with like full functionality and how they integrate in with their local ecosystems. Um, but since we're getting closer to the listener questions, there's one more I'd like to ask before we start to hand it over. And is actually voiced very well by uh, Tony here. But the idea is, what are some of the common misconceptions and misunderstandings that you find that a lot of people have that are somewhat common either in, in cultures around the world or just general understandings of agroecology that you'd like to try and dispel here or sort of correct the record on in order to give a better understanding or <laughs> I guess get over some of these things that hold a lot of people back with their management of water. I just have to jump in quick and it's the most frustrating to me is that most people don't believe this. They don't believe it. And then they mm -hmm. want you to pencil it out. So it pays itself back with 55% return on investment in two years. Sorry. We're talking about, you know, keeping our own personal financial ship afloat, staying alive, food, fuels, medicine, some fiber, ecological system health. So we can have a healthy planet to live on. F 
the cost. I'm not saying go broke doing it. We can do it in ways that don't cost a ton of money, but you've got to do it. Yeah, you think it costs a lot yeah. now? Try not having water in a couple of years and how much <laughs> it costs to import it. And, and we're already seeing that now. And I was, um, I was doing a workshop in Western Australia and Alana McTiernan actually came and opened the workshop. She was the Minister for Agriculture in Western Australia. And her message was, you know, if we're not adapting these practices and regenerating landscapes, then there will be no agriculture in Australia in the next 10 years years like she was really like Rawr! and it's like I go into workshops for large-scale conventional cropping guys and the depression and the it's almost like a, that that mindset and the ability to even think outside the box is so degraded because of mental and, and physical well-being that I, I really see the landscape reflecting what's happening with with people so it's like start with yourself start eating well start looking after your body and then what becomes possible? Because I see people that are no longer able to take any different actions. They're just going to do what the spray supply guy does and they're not going to buck the system because it takes a lot of energy. And probably the other thing I hear is like, it's not possible here. Um, it's all very well that Mark can do it in his landscape. It's so easy, you know, or it's, it's easy in Western Australia. Or, I mean, I hear it from Australians, oh, you know, New Zealanders can do it, but I hear in New Zealand, oh no, it only happens in Australia or America. And it's like, we will ignore what's happening right in front of us instead of going, actually, I, I wonder what is possible here. Like, where's the curiosity in agriculture? And that's what I'd really like to see lit up again. It is like that mind fire. Let's get excited. Yeah, I would totally agree with that. And building upon that, I'd say too, um, one of the, I have three misconceptions that I really bother me. One being people thinking, oh, that doesn't affect me here. Mm until the fire is at their doorstep, they are not thinking about water. Um, so that's a really big one. Another one that just really <laughs> bothers me is people do not connect pumping out of the aquifers with a degradation of the hydrology. It's like, oh, that water's free. It's just in the ground for me to pump out as quick and fast as I possibly can to use however I want. And whatever that flow rate on your well, which is the max that well can support, that's what I should be pumping all the time. Um, so that's one that really bothers me. And then a, a third one is that the ecosystems don't have an impact on climate, which we know very much so they do. You change the ecosystem of a place, you change the precipitation of a place, you change the drought and fire and flood regime of a place. And these are really all direct consequences of our actions. We just don't understand that puzzle yet. Very well said. All right, well, with that, I will hand it over to some of the amazing questions that have started to accumulate in the chat. But quickly, for anybody who would like to ask their question themselves, you can go down into the reactions at the bottom tab and click to raise your hand and I'll call on you just to prevent people speaking over each other. So if anybody would like a moment to ask their question in person, go ahead and uh, give that indication. But I will start with one that, <laughs> to put all of your feet to the fire. Uh, this is from Tony who said, I'd love to hear from each speaker the answers to this question. What's the biggest mistake that you've made in the process of improving landscape hydrology that we might all be able to learn from? Zach, you want to take that one first? Yeah, sure. Um, I'd say the biggest mistake that I made even for a while was always going bigger than people were really ready for being going bigger than I was ready for or going bigger than the client was ready for even more often. Um, so much of our work is creating a big disturbance. After that disturbance, you have this narrow window of time where the ecosystem really takes your suggestions pretty well. Once that window of time has passed, it's starting to become some kind of steady state and your suggestions are not as well taken. Um, so, so often at the beginning, I was having people drink from the fire hose and I was making too much bare ground that they couldn't stay on top of the management of. And so it didn't reach its highest end potential because there just wasn't enough human management to help steer it. Ecologically, it was still beautiful, but maybe it didn't produce the human food it was intended to, or maybe it didn't accomplish certain things it was intended to because there just wasn't enough available management. Peter, could you 
put yourself on mute for a second for the background noise. Nicole, do you want to take that question? Yeah, it's a it's a really interesting question, and I think in part is uh, Peter, your mic is on. Peter Merritt. Hey, um, Peter, I where think, are you? Um, we are always like it's always such a journey of learning, and I think maybe thinking that we have all the answers or that the unpredictability sure a lot of the time I mean it's always there to kind of give you a slap around the chops when you think you've got it figured out but I think some of um, my biggest lessons is around expectations so expectations for myself and expectations of others um, be because agriculture's prepared us for this you apply nitrogen and you grow more grass and we want to see that instant result or we want to see something instant that's visible um whereas something's happening underneath the ground and it's like all right how long have we been degrading this landscape a couple hundred years or well, ten thousand years if we go with um, mark's example um okay why why do you expect to see this turn around in, in in just a few months and then i see stuff that blows my mind and goes wow that changed really fast but when i brought my own property it had a calcium silicate hard pan um you can buy calcium silicate to quick set concrete. And I was like, we're going to do this and we're going to do this really fast. And, um, you know, admittedly it did take like between four to seven years to really break through that hard pen, um, just using plants and holistic management and some biostimulants. But I, I had that expectation for myself that it was going to be a bit quicker. And so I think for, for many people, it's not expecting that silver bullet and that overnight nitrogen flush. Well, I guess uh, from my perspective, uh, like as far as mistakes are concerned, I took holistic management training, you know, 25 years ago or so. And so from my perspective, there are no mistakes. There's only feedback. You do something and it tells you what to do or what not to do. Um, so that I'll, I'll try to answer the question the way others can understand it. Um, I guess one of, the, uh, one of the biggest challenges that, that I have uh, mostly with clients is like, if you've been using your land this way before um, and we do a redesign, you can't keep using your land the way you used to use it. And they say, oh, but I'm losing acres. It's like, no, you still have 100 acres or however many acres it is. We've just redesigned how it is and you will now use it according to the new design. Probably the biggest problem that clients have had that I've worked with is they continue to use the property the same way they used to. That that caused many of the problems in the first place. And I take that back mostly to a communications issue. You know, there are things that I've learned through the years and I, you know, quote unquote, no, and I say something. And if you're nodding your head and going, oh yeah, oh yeah. And you're writing notes down. I kind of expect that you really do understand. Otherwise you would have said so. So I think it's a communication issue on my part. And then the, uh, the, the other biggest um, problem, challenge, whatever, mistake that I made uh, you know, 25 years ago was not buying more land. Because uh, I know as a fact that we can purchase property 100% debt financed. We buy degraded, ratty, nasty, horrible property on debt. It's a lower price. We can cash flow it, rehabilitate it, grow food, fuels, medicines, and fiber, and create a rich, diverse, abundant ecosystem while we do it. And if I had known, if I had known how amazingly successful this is 25 years ago, I would have bought as much land as I possibly could and just kept at it. So that's why I'm still at it. <laughs> Trying to make up for lost time. There you go. Well, you've got a big community helping to, to try and move that forward as well. Uh, go ahead, Matthew. I see you've got your hand up. If you'd like to ask your question, go ahead. Matthew, you there? Yeah, I'm here. Sorry, I couldn't get unmuted there for a second. No worries. Uh, my question is, so we bought some land that uh, the topsoil was stripped off completely. Um, and we've been trying to, to reestablish re, uh, um, re good organic matter and everything in the soil. We've been bale grazing on it, um, but we're still getting horrible infiltration. We've only been working on it a year. Obviously, it's a long process, but um, is there... So what are the, what are things that we could do to help with that? I mean, they they also uh, put in some swales that I don't think are in correct places. They're more uh, just to direct water to 
uh, watershed areas instead of water catchment. Um, just, uh, um, you know, we've been trying to do a few things, but I'm, I'm just trying to figure out what's, what would be the approach of, of you guys to try and reestablish uh, an ecosystem there that actually, you know, uh, gets infiltration, you're not getting all this water runoff, and it, it's, it's mostly hard clay um, and rock. I'm in the Midwest too, by the way, if that makes a difference. <laughs> Anybody want to take that one? Well, I'll just, you know, briefly address it. Midwestern, what continent for one? What's the, what's the, the climatological regime? Uh, then let's do a basic cation exchange capacity uh, soil test to find out what the actual soil chemistry is. That'll inform what kind of little micro modifications that we can do. Now look at the ecology of your area. Those plant community types, not necessarily exactly specifically those plants, but relatives of those plants now can be planted in a system that follows the natural succession of that area. It's the plant communities and all the associated animals and critters that go with it that actually create the soil. I think it was a 1950s or 60s era uh, film uh, interview with P.A. Yeomans. He says, well, you know, your top soil may have washed away and you bemoan the fact that all you've had is, is subsoil. Well, just think about that. Your subsoil has had tens of thousands of years of preparation for you to come along. And so how I would approach that is to mimic the ecology of that area and go through successional time and then nudge it along the way with mineral amendments, with um, biological stimulants and or you know, specific biologies and then the proper mix of species. I think that- Yeah, I would ditto everything that Mark said big time. Um, and then I would add, you know, in that kind of situation, maybe you look at doing some structural adjustments. So for example, if these swales, it sounds like are maybe off contour leading to drainage areas, um, maybe you just plug up the ends of them and have them overflow in a different area, or you even make several different little check dams along the swales, um, just so that you can start infiltrating some water to help jumpstart all of those biological processes, which are really gonna be the thing that merits some type of result. I had a really cool example, Matthew, which I think follows on with these two. And it's it's in my book, now that I'm plugging the book, I'm plugging the book, sorry, I just plugged it, didn't I? Um, <laughs> so, uh, working with a racing stud. So we were very limited in terms of what we could do because they wanted it to look like a bowling green. Um, and they had scraped all their topsoil off and then put an inch back on and massive problems with rills forming and all sorts of issues going on. The whole water cycle broke down. But through using aeration, through biological foliar sprays, through we put on 10 cubic yards, no, four cubic yards, an acre of compost. And we put minerals down. I had, a, I had a, what I thought was an unlimited budget. I found out later it wasn't, but we, we did throw the kitchen sink at it, but we were growing a millimeter of soil every month, which is 1 25th of an inch. Um, and that is in a New Zealand landscape. But um, if you can look at what, what, is, what is that limitation? Why have, um, why are you not seeing soil formation despite the fact that you're putting bales on? Um, and you know, that, that process of aeration, just a little bit of aeration, um, it was with a groundhog, I think, uh, and putting biologicals down those holes, we started to see root development happening. We started to see worms appearing and microbiology firing that system up and starting to create topsoil. And um, that's probably been my fastest example of like building topsoil on top of nothing. Um, but yeah, it was a lot of fun. Nice, uh, I so, hope that um, answered your question. Miles asked, how was I monitoring that? So we had um, GPS sites and transects so we could monitor that soil depth increase. Brilliant. All right, let's go to Sadiq Khan. Would you like to answer or ask your question? Yes, please. So uh, just some context, uh, I'm working at a 700 hectare farm in Spain. Uh, as Mark has talked about uh, a lot in our climate uh, in the Mediterranean region, there's been massive desertification uh, leading to collapses of many civilizations. Um, a lot of it caused by permanent 
irrigation um, combined with uh, high salt uh, manures um, over hundreds of years, uh, uh, leading to salinification of the soil. And my question is, there's a school of thought that any kind of long-term, uh, you know, permanent large-scale irrigation is ultimately unsustainable. So I wondered how you guys approach that. You obviously, you're very much about infiltration through various means, uh, soil carbon sponge and swales and ponds and all of that kind of thing. And you spoke about um, diverting rivers and the problems with that or, um, you know, draining aquifers. But it does seem that as a, a design principle, as a kind of the physics of it, any kind of irrigation is by definition throwing water on top of the soil rather than infiltrating it underneath. Um, and yeah, I wonder what your, your feelings of that are um, over the long, long term. Um, I'd love to take a first pass at that one. You know, I think irrigation is not destructive by nature. Most of the examples you can see around the world of irrigation are generally pretty destructive, but it doesn't have to be that way. I think the big thing is look at the water in your landscape as a bank account. If you are constantly extracting more in the form of pulling water out of the aquifer or out of the rivers to hydrate the landscape then you are putting in in the form of whatever kind of catchment soil biology infiltration features the landscape has that's going to go really bad we know what happens to a bank account if you're always drawing out more than you're putting in um, now if you're doing these movements to put in large amounts of water in a lot of places from a climate perspective you have to irrigate so for example, in those projects in India I mentioned, they're really focused on getting the water into the ground, infiltrating it as rapidly as possible, not trying to store it on the surface, and then drawing that water back out of the aquifer as they need it in the dry times. Um, so, you know, I think with where we are at this point in the world, irrigation is necessary in a lot of places, but it doesn't have to be destructive irrigation. We can have a net positive water impact while also having some irrigation to keep things alive in the driest times. Ditto 100%, Zach. And you know, in the, the irrigation used to keep your plants alive, and if you're especially if you're using, like in the Mediterranean, if you're using uh, adapted deep rooted plants, you got to have to get them down to where there is permanent moisture in the soil. So it might take a few years. So perhaps you're irrigating more in the earlier years and then less and less as time goes on. Um, and and that, that, that whole uh, water deficit, if you are, if you're removing more than you're actually adding to it, that's the problem right there. So whatever rain does fall, catch it, soak it in. Once you get it below the surface, this is actually where a little bit of tillage can be helpful is especially like in dry spells that we've just recently gone through, the organic uh, farmers in the area are having a little bit better uh, time with their corn in part because they've built up the organic matter in the soil so there's more moisture there. But when, when you do get a rainfall, you now have the capillaries are connected all the way down through and you'll get this active evaporation off the surface whenever the sun comes out. But if you just lightly scratch that surface, to break the capillaries, you've got like a dust mulch on top of that soil and you don't lose as much moisture. So in an irrigation situation, irrigate at night, first thing in the morning, go ahead and break the capillaries if you're like in an annual crop situation, growing whatever your, your cash crop or, or staple crops are. Break the capillaries in the morning and you've actually put that water in the ground and you're storing it there, protecting it from the heat of the sun and yet the plants still have access uh, to it through their roots and get your long-term deep-rooted perennials established. And there are different ways of hooking up irrigation systems that promote deeper root growth, right? Things like drip irrigation or just making sure that it's soaked rather than just uh, irrigated lightly on the surface, also the time of day, wouldn't you say? Yes, you know, and that, that's especially important. Like if you use the uh, single emitter drip tapes where there's one drop coming out right at an emitter, 
you only have a wet spot on the surface this big, but you'll have, you know, something the size of a, you know, a huge gigantic, you know, medicine ball underneath. Nice. Cool. I hope that answered what your question. A lot is that people... Oh, can I add something? Yeah, of course. Sorry. There's just a little delay. Sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Sorry. I dropped out. <laughs> no, you're fine. Um, I'm finding uh, very few people dig holes to have a look at what's happening in terms of soil function. And what we see is long-term irrigation systems might have thatching. They may have water repellency. They may have been irrigating with hard water and it's created um, water systems that are just totally broken down. And then they have low organic matter and very shallow rooting systems. So looking at what is, how is that water functioning right now? Because most of that water is probably being evaporated um, or you're just passing through that system. So people are putting far too much water on. Um, mostly what I see. So really to focus on how do you build that sponge? And instead of um, having like conventional systems, very much of this, this kind of movement of water, whereas we want to build aggregate structure and stability so that water moves very slowly through that system, following all those aggregates so that when it does dry, it takes quite a while for that system to, to actually evaporate again. So how do we build aggregate structure um, how do we build water holding capacity and organic matter so that we can improve the efficiency of the irrigation we're doing? Very well said. Nice. Thank do you me. want to move on to the question with Juan Pablo? You still there, Juan Pablo? Thank you so much. Yeah, yep, I'm here. Uh, it's been all really, really interesting. And I, I just, uh, it's all French make more impact right with with the time and the resources that we have and just to second what Zach was saying in terms of sometimes aiming for something too ambitious uh, I've, I've, I've experienced that as well uh, in my own consultancy services uh, but also understanding a little bit what uh, Mark was saying in terms of actually taking the opportunity to buy a lot of degraded land and implement these uh, more ambitious projects uh, immediately I just wanted to have a pick uh, for just to, to see if you could also point me in the right direction in terms of how do you deal with the labor component? Because there's a lot of uh, um, knowledge that needs to be transferred. And uh, in the cases where this land has, has no other uh, people living in, their, in, in, the, in these places anymore because of the degraded element, uh, how do you incorporate labor and, and, or human uh, resources back into it? Oh, I figured Zach would jump on that. Go ahead, Zach. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, that's a big question, a big challenge. I think one of, there, there's two different approaches. You know, you really either want to train a group of people that think in the right way to creatively problem solve and aren't just following a recipe book. Um, or another strategy that I've seen work very well is to be really careful and consider about what actions you do and only do those actions that are going to start a natural flywheel that nature is going to keep carrying forward. So there's this concept of feedback loops. Mm -hmm. We can put something into a feedback loop and it starts becoming generative on its own. Mm -hmm. So you can look at a place like my mentors, Sepp Holters in Australia, he's managed the whole place, 45 hectares with a little bit of help, his wife and one helper with it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a huge amount of animals, a huge amount of activity over the landscape, but it was really spread out over a long period of time. Mm -hmm. And he consistently put his effort into the systems that would then become generative and not need his continued maintenance. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one of the very best strategies if that labor component is really limited. And then you can flip mm -hmm. to the other side of it, like these community scale activities where, you know, in India, it's really a million people coming together to create this movement over a huge area in Rajasthan. And the base of that is it's community driven. 
they first gather the community together. Everyone in the community voices their concerns about water. They brainstorm about what they can do. The community collectively decides what to do. And then there's buy-in from every member of the community. So everyone helps to create the project. It's very interesting. You can see government projects where they've done the same exact techniques, but it's totally failed because the community didn't understand what it was. They didn't put any maintenance into it. And then you have these beautiful examples right next to it that were community driven. Um, so I think there's those three different playbooks that you can draw from with regards mm -hmm. to that. And if I can just uh, amplify, you know, the, the ecological component of what Zach was talking about is, is when we mimic the natural plant community types of our region, that's what actually will grow really well in that area all by itself, doesn't even mm -hmm. need us. So the maintenance approaches is zero. You may not get 10,000 pounds per hectare, you may only get a thousand pounds per hectare, but your cost of actually producing that drops down to almost nothing. Um, so that's why, you know, restoration agriculture development, we stress the ecosystem mimicry as best that we can. You know, yes, you can grow peaches in, in Northern Alaska if you want, but at what expense, you know, grow what's more adapted there, blueberries, for example, um, or wherever, wherever you're located. Um, so I, I can't emphasize that part enough that the labor goes down to nothing. Well, then my situation first moving here to Southwest Wisconsin 25 years ago is uh, most of the farming operations are all mechanized. And uh, in the early years, I used to get a lot more uh, uh, derision from permaculturists saying, you can't design systems that are designed for machinery use. I said, well, whether it's a hoe, a wheelbarrow, a, a riding lawnmower or a 55 you know, foot wide tractor, we use machines. We have to design around our, our machinery and our equipment. And once again, like to, to, to echo what Zach said, specifically, what is it that we actually uh, need to do? Um, in agriculture, there's no ends of the things that you can do. Do this, do that, do this, do that. Do, 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 do. That's do, do, people. We not do. Look to nature and look at all the different things that we didn't have to do anything to nature and it did just fine. Mm -hmm. Now let's do a couple of little interventions that can help. Um, and on, the, on the, uh, the community side and working with, you know, village groups, et cetera, um, you end up with the, the whole educational people part of it. You have egos, you have uh, you know, personalities. And that's where I, my patient yeah. personality type, my patients runs thin after a while. So I usually work with a team of others. I'll talk about the technical details of how do we get this on the land? How do we manage it? And these people over here, you go in and you get everybody to get along with each other. Right. Um, what's been really inspiring for me is um, seeing how young people are returning to many landscapes. Um, and I think it's because we're bringing back that creativity. And I think of Older Spring Ranch out in Idaho, um, who are doing an extraordinary job with rehydrating their landscape and, um, you know, 45,000 acres. Uh, they use, um, they use, I mean, I guess so. It's, it's young people who, um, they had 280 applicants wanting to learn from those people and be in those landscapes. And, um, you know, a lot of these places aren't very in inspirational anymore. And it's like, what could we learn? What can fire people up? There's, there's, I, I'm seeing a whole generation that if, and are realizing that disconnect from nature and going, how do I reconnect? And how do I grow my own food? And um, yeah, I think we're seeing a, not a reversal, total reversal in trends, but like we're seeing some, there's some really interesting changes. And so I think for all of us, how do we create a story or create something on the land that people want to be engaged with. And I imagine Mark and Zach, you get a lot of people um, asking, you know, is their work available or could they come and learn from you and, you know, interning or whatever. So I, I, I know it feels like we are on a labor shortage in lots of ways we are, but there's people wanting to learn. Mm -hmm. Back to the labor shortage part of it, because one of the biggest issues with you know, these so-called mobs of people that want to come out and learn and, you know, intern and all that kind of stuff is they've bought into the myth that, that permaculture and perennial agriculture is just no work at all. You know, you got, you got <laughs> sheep that are, that are lambing and it's, you know, 34 degrees freezing rain outside. Yeah, guess what? You're out there, you're helping pull lamb. 
you know, it's, it's, you know, you got hay down and here comes the storm. You're going to bail hay until the, before the, you know, till it's all off the ground. I don't care if there's a festival tonight, you know, you've got this to do tonight. So there's a lot of people that don't uh, like the fact that it actually does uh, on occasion require massive inputs of high intensity work. It really does. Mm -hmm. And to mm -hmm. answer uh, Jeff Conley's question, yes, I'm a pretty badass banjo player up behind me, adequate on the guitar, <laughs> hot shot on the tuba, trombone, ukulele, mountain dulcimer. Um, we'll see you on stage. <laughs> I don't even know what you're doing farming with that list of skills. <laughs> that's my, it's my retirement skills. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. All right, let's quickly go to the last question. We're gonna breeze through this and, and I'll give everybody a chance to talk about how they can be contacted. Um, but I know your name is not Dorian Kern. Would you like to state your name and ask your question? You got your hand up. Nope. All right. In that case, uh, let's go ahead and let people know how they can get in touch with each of you. This would be a great time to let them know about the different books and the educational opportunities that you have available. Uh, how about starting with, uh, with Nicole? Um, my company is called Integrity Soils. Um, so you can go to integritysoils.co.nz. I have a book called For the Love of Soil, but we also have a number of online courses. Um, we just released a soil course for horses, um, which I think a lot of people think you can't have soil health and have horses. So <laughs> addressing some of those issues. Um, and as of November, we'll be running a coaching course for coaches. So people that are looking to want to step into this domain themselves and become a consultant or coach. Um, we are starting that intake next week. So that's us. Brilliant. Hi. Hello. Sorry. There's Dorian Khan or whatever. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. <laughs> yeah, sorry, man. Um, I, that's not my name. I don't know why did it come up like that. Um, <laughs> hi, guys. Um, thanks for the program. Um, I'm from South Africa. Um, my name is Rian Kirsten. Um, I grew up on a farm in South Africa in the Karoo, which is a desert area. And I realized over time, I couldn't understand why does rainwater work better than irrigation water. So a lot of you guys would have noticed that probably, that when farmers irrigate, you don't get the same growth than when, you, when it rains. So what is the difference between rainwater and normal irrigation water? So then years later, I got into, I'm an entrepreneur, grew up on a farm, and then years later, I started studying this and realized that there's a massive difference between rainwater and irrigation water. Both is H2O, but it's about uh, what is in it or what is not in it. So like you said now, Mark, you know, uh, mimic nature. So I didn't study anything. I didn't study biology or anything like that. And I just looked at pure what I see in front of me and then try to figure out what is in rainwater and not in irrigation water. So over 15 years of development, I built the machine that mimics rainwater. And now after 15 years of development and thousands of farms and machines putting out there and testing on the, on the ground and not in the lab and seeing what's the difference between if you treat rainwater, uh, irrigation water properly, and make it as rainwater that you can actually get the plants to react the same way than when they get irrigation water and you can just treat it properly with oxygen. So I build a machine that makes the same molecules that you get in rainwater and the same way it's made in nature. Then I can install it with a farmer in his irrigation system and we treat these water and it reacts more or less the same way than rainwater. Quite exciting. So all those, all those stories you've been talking about, getting the uh, organisms in the soil, the fungi in the soil, um, penetrate the water. I mean, we've all seen like you guys, um, when it rains 25 millimeters or an inch of rain, that rainwater penetrates into the soil. But as soon as a farmer irrigates 10 millimeters of water with a pivot, it just stands on the soil. 
And that's the viscosity of the water that's not right and it can't penetrate the soil. So by just changing that and putting, act, we call it activated oxygen or ozone or nitrogen and all those kind of molecules that's in there, we put that under pressure into the water and we change the structure of the water. That water penetrates 30% quicker into the soil. It stimulates the microorganisms, oxidize the metals and contaminants that's in the water and even make it available to plants. So by talking about farms and talking about forests, we changed our vision to make every farm a forest. And Very interesting. It's Do there. you have a question just because we're running out of time? Okay, yeah. Now, all I want to, the question I want to have is, is I want to uh, please connect with you guys and tell you about this because like Graham Sait in Australia is an advocate of our product. And to help the farmers all over the world, that's what we want to do, is to treat the water with four people so that they can grow more food, proper food. So the question is actually, how can we connect to you guys? But then you started to, to change to that side of it, and everybody is giving the details. So yeah, thanks for listening. Thanks a lot. Okay, so you guys want to go ahead and continue with uh, contact information and where people can find more information? Zach, perhaps? Sure. Um, yeah. So my business is Elemental Ecosystems, elementalecosystems.com. We do consulting and contracting around the world. Uh, and then we've just recently started. We haven't really launched it yet, but there is a, a version online um, of a new educational training platform called Water Stories, waterstories.app.app. Um, Nicole already joined us on a webinar, and I'm hoping to get Mark soon on there. Um, and yeah, hopefully it'll become really a, a place where people can gain the activities and skills they need to start doing this in their own lives. Fantastic. Uh, do you want to put the link perhaps down in the chat so anybody can get it? Yeah. And Mark. Uh, contact uh, us, contact restorationag.com. Um, for the consulting design work, uh, our uh, online um, offerings are starting with um, basic terrestrial ecology for the person who's going to be designing a, a diverse perennial uh, polyculture agroforestry system. And that's at restoringagriculture.com. And, and one of the things that, that uh, um, the previous fellow from South Africa just caused me to, you know, want to reiterate with all, all of us um, what Nicole is doing and what Zach is doing, uh, and you know what what I'm doing and my, my team and all of our teams are doing. We love this. We are passionate about this. This is the most important, compelling work that can be done for humanity right now, and we need all of us. There is no time for that team, this team, there's no time for predator practices. There's only time for us to all pull together and work with one another. So now we can get the synergies of this larger uh, social organism of restorationists making this planet green and moist and livable again. And so I wanna work with all of you guys, everybody on this, this entire uh, list and especially you, Zach and Nicole. Amen to that, totally agree. Excellent. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure having all of you here. I'm really glad you said that too, Mark, because I'm definitely going to be hitting up all three of you for some really cool projects that we're just getting started with here in Europe. And Climate Farmers is really leading the charge here right now, trying to get to 10% of all of farming done in Europe to regenerative uh, practices. I mean, the whole wide context of that within the next five years. And we need everybody's help. We need everybody here who's attended. Uh, and if anybody is actively farming here right now, you can register your farm at climatefarmers.org. And we have a lot of increasing resources and opportunities that we can share with you. So um, yeah, we really look forward to connecting again with all of you. Thank you so much, Mark, Zach, and Nicole for taking the time to share you some of your knowledge and your insights with us today. And I hope all of you also reach out to them and check out some of the great resources that they already mentioned. So until the next time, we will have another expert panel and we'll be sending out registration links and some promotion for that as soon as 
uh, we get the final participants confirmed. And I look forward to this continuing to be a platform in which we can share the best knowledge and concepts that are out there in agriculture at the moment. So thanks once again, and we'll see you guys on the next call. Take care. Bye everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Great you. To see you again, Bye, Karen. Everyone. So many familiar Thank you so much for everyone. Such amazing insights. There's Milan. <laughs> Thank you. Bye bye. After Take party. care, everyone. That's what I'm here for. <laughs> it's the after party. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Take yeah. care, everyone. Bye. All right. I guess. <laughs> See ya. <laughs>